Hi, my name is Sima Sabah, and I am a computer vision researcher. I have been working in the field for the past 10 years, and I still get excited every time I hear about a new cool idea. This is exactly what happened when I first heard about flow-based generative models, which apparently have been around for a while, but most people I know haven't heard about them. The purpose of this talk is to change that and get you to appreciate them as much as I do. We will start the talk by presenting the problem deep image generators are facing. Then we will go over the main idea of generative adversarial networks, variational autoencoders, and flow-based generative models, and we'll finish by a comparison between the methods. Deep image generators can be seen as artists. During training, they use many images to learn a model, let's call it G. And in inference, they start with random canvases and use G to generate images that looks like the one they have seen in training. So what does this G function learning? Well, ideally, we would like it to learn the probability P to generate an image X from the distribution of our training images. This way, we can just sample P and generate realistic images. The thing is that computing this probability is really hard. It requires going over all of the canvases in the world, which is not very practical. Each type of image generator has a different approach to handle this issue, and we will discuss it in this talk. All image generators are trained to be artists. The difference is in the teaching method. Let's start with generative adversarial networks with a tough, uncompromising teacher. GANs have two competing components. The first is the generator, which is like the artist we have seen before trying to generate images of cats. His adversary, the discriminator, is like an art critic. It has a bunch of real images of cats, and given two images, he needs to determine which one is real and which one was generated by the artist. In the beginning, the artist doesn't really know how to draw a cat, so it's pretty easy for the discriminator to decide what is a real image. This requires the generator to learn and train until it produces something that looks like a cat. Now the discriminator has to work harder to decide, but once it learns, it raises the bar again for the generator. This goes on until the generator becomes so good that the discriminator can no longer tell the difference. If we formalize this, our generator is a learned network G that produces an image given a random input C. And the art critic or discriminator is another learned network D that given two images, classified them as real or fake. And this is being optimized with minimax on the classification loss. This means that the generator and discriminator have opposite objectives and they take turns training. When G D is being trained, G is being fixed and we minimize the classification error. And when G is being trained, D is being fixed and we maximize the classification error. In inference, we no longer need the discriminator. We can just randomly sample Z and generate images using the generator. The next family we're gonna talk about are variational autoencoders with a cool teacher. Variational autoencoders also have two components, only this time they work together. We start with an image X and encode it into a latent space using our encoder. The latent space is the probability to generate a variable Z given the input X, usually modeled as a Gaussian, from which we can sample a specific Z and use the decoder to decode it to another image X tag it hopefully looks like the one we started with. And we optimize this with a lower bound on the probability of access we wanted to optimize. We said in the beginning of the talk that we don't really know how to optimize for P of X, but this lower bound allow us to write it as two terms that we can compute. The first is a reconstruction term. We want our decoded image to be as close as possible to our input image, just like with other autoencoders. The second term is a regularization term. We want our latent space to be normally distributed, meaning having a mean of zero and standard deviation of one. So why would we even want to regularize our latent space? Well, let's say we didn't. If we look at the visualization of the latent space, it would look somewhat like that. Every training image would be mapped into a colorful blob in the latent space. And if we sample from it, we will generate an image that looks like this training image. The thing is that we don't really have this visualization in inference. We don't really know where our training images were encoded to. And we might just sample from somewhere in the middle. And what would we get in this case? The problem is that we would get something completely random. And this is not a desired quality in a generative model. 
what happens when we regularize the space is that we basically push all these distributions together to be around the normal distribution. So now our latent space is much more complete. So now if we sample from the normal distribution, it is much more likely that we will generate a valid image. This regularization also generates some order in the latent space. And usually similar images are being embedded next to each other. And this allows us to do some cool tricks. Let's say we wanted to interpolate between the triangle and the circle. What we can do is use the encoder to encode them into the latent space, interpolate between them in the latent space, and now we can use the decoder on different points on this interpolation line to generate new images that interpolate between the triangle and the circle in the image space. Pretty cool, huh? So in training, we train the encoder and decoder together to reconstruct the image given the regularization. And in inference, we just randomly sample Z and use the decoder to generate images. The last family we're gonna talk about are flow-based generative models with a didactic professor. The architecture of flow-based models resembles the one of variational autoencoders, but it has some fundamental changes. We still have an image X that is being encoded into our latent space, which is normally distributed and decoded back to another image X tag that looks like the one that we started with, only this time our encoder is called a flow and implements a function F, and our decoder is called an inverse flow and implements the exact inverse function. This means that we don't really need to train the decoder. We can just train a single network during training, which is our flow. And in inference, we can just invert this function to generate new images. The other change is that because this is an invertible function, we want the dimension of Z to be in the same dimension as X and not in the smaller dimension like we're usually having in our encoders. So schematically speaking, it looks more like that. Z is in the same dimension of X, only normally distributed. And those changes allow us to directly optimize the probability of real data, which is our holy grail. So let's dive in into what is a flow and why it is useful in a generative model. A flow or a normalizing flow is a probabilistic tool to map X from a complex distribution into Z from a simpler distribution using an invertible function. So we can also go back from Z to X. And we can use the mapping between Z and X in order to write the probability of X that is hard to compute as a function of the probability of Z that is easier to compute. And if we follow the change of variable rule, we would get this expression that has two terms. The first is P of Z, the probability of our simpler distribution. And this is where the magic happens. This is where we decide what would be the distribution of our latent space. We would usually use a normal distribution, but you could choose another Gaussian, uniform, or anything you can evaluate during training. The second term is a scaling factor. All it does is making sure that this expression is still a valid probability distribution and sums into one. Mathematically speaking, this is the determinant of the Jacobian matrix of this transformation, but although it looks scary, it is just a single number that normalizes this distribution. So what are the conditions from this transform function for it to be useful in a generative model? First of all, the Jacobian determinant has to be easy to compute. And this is because we optimize this during training. And if this is slow to compute, then training would be slow as well. Secondly, the uh, it has to be easily invertible because we want to use it as a generative model, meaning generate X from Z. And for this, we need to use the inverse function. And we know that in the generative model, the probability of X is the distribution of our training images, which is very, very complex. So what are the chances that you can find a single function that will map this very complex distribution into a normal distribution and still hold these conditions? It is much more likely that we will have a slow training. And this is where we use the last piece of normalizing flows. A flow is not a single function. It is actually a composition of functions that gradually transforms the complex distribution into a simple one, one function at a time. And the nice thing about composition is that the inverse function is actually a composition of each of the inverse functions. This means that we can use simpler function as intermediate functions that hold the two conditions that we talked about, and the whole flow would hold them as well. And the fact that we're composing different functions will generate the complex function that we need. 
So let's put it back in our generative model. We learn a single function, which is the flow. And the composition of function transforms in the neural network world into different blocks being stacked together. Each one is easily invertible with easy to compute Jacobian determinant. And they are trained together uh, when we directly optimize the probability of real data with this objective. And in inference, we can just use the inverse flow to either reconstruct X from Z or just randomly sample Z from the normal distribution and use the inverse flow to generate new images. The inverse flow is just the inverse blocks being stacked together in reverse order. So now that we've learned about the three main families of generative models, why should you use flow-based models? Well, first of all, quality-wise, they generate amazing images. This is the same high resolution we're used to from GANs that are known for the high resolution images. They are so known as there is actually a website called This Person Does Not Exist with images that were being generated by GANs that are so realistic that this uh, name is actually fitting. And this is much better than a typical quality of a regional auto encoder that tends to generate blurry images. There are some recent papers on VAEs that are able to generate high resolution images but it is much more harder to do uh, in this method and requires a lot of engineering. If we look at the optimization, we already know that flow-based model optimize our holy grail, which is the probability of real data, while VAEs uh, optimize the lower bound that has two terms, reconstruction and regularization, that has a trade-off between each other, can optimize minimax on the classification loss. The optimum solution for this kind of optimization is being reached in Nash equilibrium, which is very unstable. One example of why this can be tricky is what happens if the discriminator is being trained too quickly. This way, no matter what the generator will do, it will keep getting the same feedback, that it's not good enough. And this is not productive. Without some good feedback, it can never learn what a good image looks like, and this will never converge. If we look at the probability estimation, since flow optimize uh, the probability of real data directly, they estimate it exactly, while VAEs optimize a lower bound, so they try to approximate this probability. GANs don't explicitly try to optimize the probability, but the discriminator does teach the generator how to generate images from the distribution of real images. We can look at it as if we're implicitly learning a subset of this distribution. And in extreme cases, this subset may only be a single image. So maybe we can generate one cat perfectly, but we will keep generating the same cat. And this is being referred to as mode collapse. Reversibility-wise, meaning if you want to generate a specific image, when we have a mapping between our image space into our latent space, we can just use this mapping, and we know what the Z we need in order to reconstruct the image exactly or approximately. With GANs, there is no such mapping. We will have to search the whole space of Z to try to find the Z that will generate this image, and it is not guaranteed that we will find it because we only learn a subset of this distribution. If you look at the latent space, the latent space of both flows and VAEs is normally distributed, and this is usually generating some order in the latent space that allow us to change a single attribute and interpolate on it in the latent space to generate the nice videos that you see here. With GANs, there is no such regularization in the latent space, so it is much harder to do uh, than with the other methods. Having said that, there are quite a few recent papers that are able uh, to interpolate in the latent space and change a single attribute, but it is harder to do than with other methods. So let's review the teachers we've seen. The first teacher we talked about is for generative adversarial networks with a tough, uncompromising teacher. He doesn't give much guidance, only whether the final result is good enough or not, but he does push his students to be the very best and generate amazing art. However, not all students can handle the pressure, so not all of them become artists. Next teacher we talked about is for variational autoencoders with a cool teacher. He teaches his students to do the job, but doesn't push them to be the very best. Instead, he teaches them how to do some cool tricks if they want to. His students will not generate the best art, but still be decent artists and will be more famous for the extra capabilities that they have. The last teacher we talked about is for the flow-based models with a didactic professor. 
As long as you follow these instructions and do your homework, you are guaranteed to generate amazing art, but you are required to put in the work. So which one will you choose? Feel free to reach out and tell me what you think. If you want to learn more, check out these links or just invite me to give the full talk. Thank you for your time.